Good afternoon. Welcome to a first class of measurement in engineering. Uh, my name is Martin Novak. I'm coming from the Department of Instrumentation and Control Engineering from this faculty. And uh, I will have the lectures and I will also have one of the lab groups in the labs that will follow after this lecture. Uh, so if you need anything from me, here you have my email address. So write me an email or come to my office. My office is uh, in block B1. That's the, the block that you see through the window over there. And it's in third floor, room 318. Uh, you will also need uh, the access to our website uh, where you will find the course materials. So that's it, moodle.fs.cvt.cz and so forth. Uh, so um, in, on this web page you will find all the required study materials uh, that you will need for the lectures and for the labs as well, especially for the labs. Uh, you can uh, log in into the web page with the same login like you have uh, for the study system and for your fac faculty email. And uh, when you register there for the first time, it will create you an account automatically and you will have access to the classes. Uh, and uh, you will find this course under Instrumentation and Control Engineering and then uh, the name of the class, Measurement in Engineering. Um, I will briefly show you uh, this web page, how does it look like, so that you just have an idea uh, what you will find there. We will discuss it in more detail in the lab class. Uh, so here is what you should see. Uh, you should see the schedule for the lectures. Uh, there are the lecture presentations that I will share with you. Uh, you have uh, some lecture notes which is uh, basically an extended version of the lecture that includes text and explanation. Uh, and uh, there is also a lecture video. We are recording the lecture so I'm putting the videos online so if you miss the lecture for some reason uh, you can uh, look it look look on the video later and you can learn what we have discussed on the lecture. Uh, for the lab classes, th this is uh, quite important because uh, there will be a schedule for the lab classes and uh, starting from next week we will work in at least three groups and every group will cycle through different labs and here is where you will find the schedule. And uh, you will find also uh, the manuals for uh, for the labs um, on this web page, so you should read it before and and you should know what we will be doing on the lab. Uh, so, we'll, as I said, we'll discuss this more on the lab, which will be on quite soon in the afternoon. Uh, this subject uh, will be about measurement of uh, non-electrical properties. So it means temperature, pressure, humidity, position and so on. So, and we will discuss how to measure those properties, uh, what sensors are good for those selected variables and uh, in what range can you use the sensor, uh, under what conditions can you use it and uh, I will try to focus this on industrial applications. So how to measure temperature, how to measure position in industrial situations when you have some machine and you want to equip that with the sensor. So we will discuss uh, how the sensor works, what is the physics behind, just briefly, and then I will show you uh, some examples of those sensors, some uh, data about the ranges, where it can work, with what accuracy and so on. So, uh, why is it important for a mechanical engineer to know how to measure something? Uh, if you look around you, you will find that uh, almost all devices have some form of measurement. So, uh, you can have a cell phone and in the cell phone you will have an accelerometer uh, which will measure the orientation of the screen. Uh, you can have a car, and in a car uh, there are hundreds of sensors, and without those sensors the car 
but at least the modern car would not work properly. So you have sensors for temperature, you have sensors for speed, you have sensors for distance, uh, you have uh, sensors uh, in a mirror that detects that there is a car passing by and so on. So there are hundreds of sensors in everyday applications. If we look a little bit closer in a, a combustion engine, you again have hundreds of sensors. You have sensors for temperature, you have sensors for speed, you may have sensors for torque, uh, you may have sensors for flow, for oxygen level and so on. So again, there are many applications of uh, sensors. Uh, this is just a brief overview to show you where you can find the sensors and when we will be discussing specific sensors I will come back to those applications and I will show you what kinds of sensors are used in those applications. Uh, some of you have come to the Czech Republic by plane so even planes have hundreds maybe thousands of sensors so this is just an example uh, of uh, an aircraft engine and uh, you may measure uh, revolutions, you may measure pressure, you may measure temperatures, you may measure positions. In the evening, when you go uh, to a pub and drink beer, uh, you will find out that also sensors are required to manufacture good beer. So this is a, an example of uh, the beer manufacturing process. So it starts from the materials that are stored somewhere in the silos that are cooked and bottled at the end. And here uh, this is just a selection. You see we measure temperatures, we measure flow, we measure liquid levels, uh, we may measure some chemical properties and so on. So again there are hundreds of sensors uh, that make sure that at the end it's a good product. Um, Mechanical engineers manufacture some products from metals. So even here you may find many, many sensors. So this is um, steel rolling or aluminum rolling. And uh, again, you may measure temperature. You may measure the distance of those rollers to have a good thickness. Uh, you may measure uh, the speed which, with which you extrude the product so that you have a good thickness and so on. Um, if you pack the products at the end, uh, you need to make sure that you have the given amount of the products in the boxes. So this is an example of, um, of a packing line. You see here we have some boxes and you need to make sure that the box is it at the correct position. Uh, you need to make sure that it's full with the product, so you will wait it. And then at the end, uh, you seal the box, you will verify if the box is sealed. And uh, all this is done by sensors. So there are many sensors here that detect the position of individual uh, elements on the, on the conveyor belt. Here there are many products, uh, many sensors that detect temperature. For example, if you uh, glue the boxes with some hot glue, you need to measure temperature. If you uh, pack the, the products in boxes, you will probably need to weigh the box to make sure that it's correctly filled and so on. Now, last two examples. Uh, if you mill something on a CNC mill, then you again need many sensors. Uh, you need to measure the position of the individual axis. Uh, you need to measure the speed of the spindle, you need to measure temperature of the oil and of the, of the fl cooling liquid and so on. So again, there are many sensors used in those applications. Uh, and last example, um, this is a, a car manufacturing, that's welding, and you see here robots and the robots have sensors for position at each joint so that you know exactly at which position it is. You have sensors for uh, the welding wire to, to, to verify that it's working correctly. Uh, you may have sensors for temperature and so on. So uh, that's just an overview uh, where sensors are used. Uh, sensors and measurement is uh, currently the foundation of our technology. We need to measure something and then we will control something. So uh, without the sensors in the applications we would not be able to 
produce the products. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the measurement is just the first step. So uh, if you uh, know how to measure some property like temperature, humidity, position, uh, you may build a good machine, but uh, if you do not design your machine properly, then it's clear that no sensors will help you at the end. So uh, it's really a first step and uh, a mechanical engineer needs to understand how uh, he can measure something for the design and then he needs to uh, design the machine properly. So this is, um, let's say, an introductory course into sensors uh, that will help mechanical engineers uh, to design th their machine properly. Uh, there are um, many information about sensors that you will find in textbooks, uh, on the internet, in um, some manuals and so on. Uh, for this class, it will be sufficient if you go to the lectures or if you l read the lecture notes that are on the internet. Uh, this is again the email address where you may find the lecture notes. Uh, for each lecture, uh, there is, let's say, between 30 and 50 pages of uh, lecture notes. So, But some of them are for two lectures, because uh, some topics are uh, very large, and uh, I have made two lectures. For example, temperature is quite important, position is quite important, so there will be two lectures uh, for some of those selected variables. Uh, the second option, if you do not want to read the lecture notes, is uh, to get a textbook, uh, which um, is quite good. It's called Master Book on Sensors, and um, you see it looks like this. It's quite thick. Uh, obviously, we will discuss only some selected topics from this book, but on the other hand, not all that we will cover in the class is included in this textbook. So this is not a textbook for this class, but uh, it's uh, a textbook that is general for sensors, and uh, you may uh, learn more about these topics in the textbook as well. Uh, the textbook is available in the National Library, uh, which is uh, right across the street. So if you go out from Faculty of Mechanical Engineering, you go to the right, there is like uh, some circle building and that's the library. And uh, they have like 20 copies that you can borrow uh, and you can study yourself. Uh, we will have also uh, lab classes and uh, we will cycle through different labs. This week, we will be all together in one lab, uh, which is uh, lab 409. Uh, if you go out from this room, go to the end of the corridor, it's at the, the very end. Uh, but starting from next week, uh, we will go through different labs. So uh, today we are somewhere around here, and 409 is at the end of the corridor. Uh, this is the entry to the faculty, and here are the computer rooms. Uh, starting from next week, we'll be cycling to different labs, which you see here on the plan. The plan is also uh, at the website, so uh, you can check uh, in what lab you will be. Um, I will be talking about it on the lab class, since you are definitely not all here. Uh, in the first two weeks, uh, we will be moving between lab 409, between the optical lab, and between a second optical lab that is, that is here. But starting from uh, week 4, we will start also in lab 156, that is at the very end of the building. So if you look from the window, it's in this way. And uh, each group will have to find their, their own lab who will be assigned to what lab, uh, you will learn in about one and a half hours on the lab class. Uh, one very important thing, there is no exam from this subject at the end, and uh, the grade is uh, done by the sum of points that you will get during the semester. 
So you need to work during the semester. We will write two tests. One will be week six, one will be week 11. And um, there will be also other options how you can get the points. So at the end, we will sum those points and this will be your grade. So there is no exam at the end and the grade is composed from the sum of those points. So uh, you need to work regularly during the semester. You cannot save your grade at the very end of the semester. Uh, one way how we can get some points is also during the lectures. So this is to encourage you to go to the lectures. And uh, starting from next week, during the lecture, at a random time, I will open a test online that you can do. And uh, you can have this as a bonus point uh, for the grade that you will have at the end. So it's not, you, you, if you don't want, you don't have to, you don't have to do it but you can gain up to 12 points, which is like 12% of the final grade. Uh, the test will be done in the Moodle system, so you need some access to the internet, like a tablet or cell phone or something. And uh, I will open this at a random time. So I hope that this will encourage you to go to the lectures and pay attention. Uh, each test will be up for up to one point and uh, each test will have four questions. Two questions will be from the previous lecture and two questions will be from the current lecture. And uh, the answers are very simple. It's typically A, B, C, D, so just mark the correct answer. In some cases it will be some simple calculation that you can do in your head, like how, what, what is 50% of uh, time constant that is given. So you may calculate this very easily. And uh, I think that we will uh, spend at around five minutes for this Moodle test. So uh, four questions sometime uh, before you register into the test so uh, normally I do is like for 45 seconds for each question as I said it's like one sentence and then a b c d answers so it's also for me a feedback to see how do you pay attention and if you remember this topic or if you don't uh, one last thing is uh, about the safety in the labs uh, our check regulations require that all students are briefed in handling electrical devices and providing first aid. Without this, you cannot work at all in the labs. So, uh, if you have a class that's called electrical machines and drives, then the test is done in this other subject. If you don't have electrical machines and drives, uh, then uh, there will be a separate date where you can pass this test and uh, this, will be, this will be on Friday, uh, March 2nd, so in two weeks from 2.15. The lab number is written here and uh, it will be done by my colleague, Mr. Josef Vilcek. So if you have the class that's called Electrical Machines and Drives, you don't need to go there because you will pass the, the security briefing in this subject. If you do not have electrical machines and drives, go to this briefing and test on Friday in two weeks and my colleague will explain you what you should know and then at the end he will do the test with you. Uh, it's really important because uh, if you are not briefed in handling electrical devices, and providing first aid. After week number four, you cannot continue in the lab classes. So it, this means that you will fail the class. Uh, the topics that are covered in this test are also available in the Moodle system. So there is a document, it's like eight pages, 
of text that you need to learn and uh, you need to be ready to, to answer the questions. Uh, in the test there are always four questions. Uh, one question is always how to provide first aid in some way. And three questions are about how to handle the electrical devices. And you need to answer correctly all those four questions. If you do not pass this test, uh, then my colleague may offer you some other date, but uh, it cannot be later than the fourth week. For the first four weeks, we will be just playing. We will have some normal devices, but starting from week four, we will have hot, hot water. Uh, we will have electrical devices that are near this water. Uh, we will have uh, compressed gas and so on. So who does not pass this test until week number four cannot continue in the class. Any questions so far? So I will be talking about the requirements for the labs a little bit more on the lab class. And the topic for today and for next week is uh, sensor basics. And uh, we will be talking about how to understand properties of the sensor, how to understand accuracy, how to read correctly from the instruments. And uh, at the end of next week, we will start also with temperature sensors and temperature sensor placement. So uh, if you look at any application, uh, you want to measure some physical property. This will be position, this will be temperature, humidity. Uh, so this is what is on the beginning. It starts as a physical property. I will typically call that X in the equations. And uh, the sensor uh, will transfer this physical property into some electric signal. In this class, we will be talking only about sensors that have electric output. Of course, there are other possibilities, you can have this, sig this signal pneumatic, you can have uh, hydraulic signals and so on, but we will be talking only about electric signals. So we'll be talking mostly about the sensors that you see here, but the electric signal from the sensor in most cases needs some processing. So you need to amplify it. You have a small voltage that is here at the sensor output and you need an amplifier. Uh, you may need filters. You may need to filter out 50 Hz frequency from the power network because it's a disturbance. So you need additional blocks that are here connected. Uh, they are taking the electric signal, they are amplifying it, they are doing something with the signal and at the end uh, you will need some gauge. So this will be a voltmeter, uh, this will be a computer system that will take in your signal. And in this class, we'll be talking only about the sensor itself and about the gauges that are here. So we'll not be talking about amplifiers, we'll not be talking about signal processing. Uh, this is uh, handled in electronic classes. We'll be talking only about the sensors. Uh, one of the mo very important, and I would say maybe critical even, uh, topic is uh, steady state. It will be the most important thing from the whole course. So uh, who will not know what is steady state at the end of the class will definitely fail it. Uh, why is it so important? All the sensor properties, well, almost all sensor properties, will be defined in steady state. So we'll be looking at uh, the behavior of the sensor. How is the output of the sensor changing when you have some change at the input? And this will be explored in steady state. So imagine that uh, we have some tank with water and uh, I have some temperature sensor. The input for my sensor is X. This is the temperature of the water. And 
I'm, I'm reading the sensor output, which I will call Y for no reason at all. And uh, if I want to explore the properties of the sensor, I uh, will do this in steady state. And uh, steady state in this context means that uh, we have a stable input and we have a stable output as well. We will see that this is not always the case and uh, we will also learn how to handle this. We'll do this in the next lecture. But everything that you will see today will be handled in steady state. Now let me do uh, a short experiment here. I will have um, a temperature sensor. So this is a temperature sensor we will discuss what is it next week? And uh, what you will see here will be the voltage that I read from this temperature sensor. So uh, right now I will assume that the sensor is in steady state. And when I turn it on, um, if this would be really in steady state, I should see a straight line. Let's try it. So here you see this is the voltage from the sensor. Uh, it's constantly decreasing. This is auto scaled, so uh, of course if I now zoom it, you see there happen there's something happening. So this is definitely not in steady state. But it will always depend on uh, the range that you choose. It will never be in steady state, but if I choose the range uh, large enough, it will look like it's in steady state. So we will learn how to work with this in th the next lecture. Now let me do let me do this. I will do an experiment. I will heat the sensor. Uh, I will now assume that this is in steady state, and uh, I will try to heat the sensor like this. And uh, now it's clear that here I have a constant temperature and now here I have a constant temperature as well. So if I do this, we'll see there is a quick reaction, but uh, there is some response. So uh, even if I remove the flame, uh, there will be some reaction as well. This will be called a transient characteristic like this and uh, we'll be talking about it next week. For now, for today, it means that we need to wait for some time before we have steady state. Now I have constant input, but the output of the sensor is not steady yet, and I need to wait until I have steady state value. So almost all our lab experiments uh, will be happening in steady state. So we'll change temperature of the water and we'll wait until we have constant input and constant output. Some of our experiments in the lab will look like this. We will look on the time behavior of the sensor and uh, we will try to describe how fast the sensor is, uh, how fast can I measure uh, with the sensor and uh, what is basically the, the sampling frequency that I can choose for the given sensor. So this is steady state. The output of uh, our experiments uh, will typically be a steady state characteristic. And a steady state characteristic is a function that describes the sensor output as a function of sensor input. So if this would be this the same experiment, sensor input is water temperature, sensor output is some signal from the sensor, like the voltage that I had here, uh, the steady state characteristic will be this dependence. What's important is that this is in steady state. So you always need to wait when you have constant input and constant output and then you can read the input temperature and output signal from the sensor. Uh, so this is called a steady state characteristic. Uh, you can find it in data sheets for the sensors uh, as a chart. Uh, it can be a table or it can be a mathematical type this is, but it's some description of the sensor behavior. Uh, you may encounter also other 
characteristic, uh, which we will call a user characteristic. It's uh, exactly the same. It's also in steady state, but uh, the user characteristic is the function between sensor output and sensor input. Both may look like this, so both are in steady state, but the difference is in the axis. The steady state characteristic has sensor input on the x-axis and sensor output on the y-axis, and then there is some dependence, linear or nonlinear. Uh, whereas the user characteristic has x-axis sensor output and sensor input. You may create the user characteristic from the steady state and vice versa. Uh, the reason why we can use those two characteristics is dependent on how do we look on the sensor signal. Uh, if you are a user of the sensor, you measure temperature in some process, then uh, you want to know what is the temperature in the tank. So you read sensor output, sensor output will be the signal, voltage or uh, resistance, and then you look in the table and you say, okay, five millivolts corresponds to 100 centigrades. So this will be the user characteristic. Typically in the data sheets, of sensors you will find however the steady state characteristic so sensor input temperature 100 centigrades corresponds to voltage 5 millivolts so uh, we'll work with both but most often we will work with the steady state characteristic which you will typically find in data sheets if you look on the steady state characteristic uh, it's clear that uh, the slope of this characteristic will also tell you something about the sensor. Uh, the slope will be called sensitivity and uh, we will also in many experiments look for the sensitivity of some sensor. So in general the sensitivity is uh, the slope of your steady state characteristic at a given point. So if I want to calculate it for this point, for example, I need to calculate the slope, which means I need to make a tangent here at this point. So I will calculate a limit when x is going to zero. So uh, there will be a sensitivity here. If this is a nonlinear steady state characteristic, you may have different sensitivities. So, for example, here you will have higher sensitivity than at this point. And uh, the units of uh, the sensitivity will always be, uh, here you see delta y over delta x. So if I take the example of my sensor, uh, I had the input was temperature, output was voltage. So uh, here I would have centigrades, for example, and here I would have millivolts. So in my case, uh, this would be millivolts per centigrade. If you have a different sensor that will give you electrical resistance as a function of temperature, then uh, you can have ohms per centigrade, for example. Uh, at the end, it looks like this. Uh, so for example, a very common sensor for temperature is called PT100. And the PT100 has sensitivity of 0 0.385 ohms per centigrade. Uh, if it's given like this, just a number, it means that the steady state characteristic is linear. And if, if the characteristic is linear, it also means that you have a constant sensitivity. So for this reason, uh, we re really like sensors that have linear characteristic because we can describe them just with one number with one sensitivity. If you have a nonlinear characteristic, then you see that the slope, the sensitivity is changing and we typically need a table or a mathematical function that describes the behavior. So the goal is uh, to select sensors that preferably have linear characteristic uh, because then we can have a, an easy description. Uh, it's not always possible, uh, so 
we will see also sensors that don't have a linear characteristic, but then they typically have some advantage, like a real high sensitivity or real high temperature range and so on. A very important question is also how accurate is our experiment? How accurate is the reading that we get from our instruments? So now, until the end of today's lecture, uh, we will discuss ways how we can make an estimate about the accuracy. Uh, there are two ways. One is an older way, and this is using absolute and relative error. I will start with this. And uh, then there is a relatively new way, like 30 years ago, uh, which describes the accuracy with uncertainty. Uh, I will start with the historically older one, because uh, it's uh, quite easy to understand, and uh, it will help us to understand the uncertainties that are much more complicated. So one way how I can estimate my accuracy is uh, to calculate the absolute and relative error. So let's say uh, I will measure some number from an instrument and I can calculate uh, the absolute error if I take the measured value and subtract the correct value. Now you immediately see what's the problem here. The problem is that I don't know what is the correct value. And that's the whole problem of this definition. You are comparing your measurement with something that you think is correct, but you don't know if it's true. So uh, the correct value is typically obtained by measurement with a more accurate instrument. So you compare, uh, for example, two voltmeters one which measures with accuracy of, let's say, 5% or 2%, and you say, I will take the correct value from an instrument that has accuracy of 0 0.1. But in all cases, this is the problem of this definition. You have to know the correct value, which you never know. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we can use this to calculate some result. So, uh, here we have the absolute error as a difference and uh, we can also uh, use this absolute error to find out what is uh, or if we are already in the steady state. So uh, if you, if I go back here, well, I forgot to, uh, to stop it, but uh, this is again the signal from the voltmeter, you see it's constantly decreasing and now I can measure the absolute error. I know that the input of my sensor is now constant so I would expect that this would be a straight line. I know it's decreasing slowly and the difference between what I measure and between what I assume to be correct is uh, the steady state error. So uh, in the equations we can find out the steady state error by using this formula. This y infinity is the steady state value. So this should be uh, at infinite time. And here we have the correct value which I obtained somehow. Now, uh, the steady state error obviously is a function of time. And uh, with increasing time, the steady state error will decrease. So I will get closer and closer to the correct value or to the new steady state value. And next week, we will learn how to use this formula uh, and how to understand how fast the sensor is. So this is the absolute error. Uh, the units of absolute error are obviously always he the, the same like uh, the units of what I measure. So in, in my experiment, uh, let's say the output was voltage, so then in this case it would be, would be volts. If I would use a sensor with resistive output, uh, it would be ohms, for example. So it's always the same like uh, what you measure. The second way 
is uh, to calculate the relative error. And the relative error is uh, the ratio between the absolute error and uh, between the measured value. So here you see in this equation, uh, this is the absolute error, this is the measured value, and relative error is typically expressed in percent, so then uh, I multiply it by 100 and I have relative error 5%, for example. So now what, what is it this good for? Uh, it's good because we can use absolute and relative error to understand the accuracy of our measuring instruments. So now I will show you how to work with those absolute and relative errors if you have uh, an analog or a digital instrument. Uh, we will very often in our labs use instruments like this let's say analog voltmeters or ampere meters. And uh, for analog voltmeters or analog instruments in general, uh, the accuracy is typically not given as an absolute or relative error, but is given in something that's called an accuracy class. An accuracy class is using a d the definition of a relative error, but compares this to a full deflection of the needle. So, for example, if I have this voltmeter here, on this voltmeter I will find out, typically on this right-hand corner, that the accuracy class is 0 0.5 and this means that the maximum relative error is 0 0.5 percent, but only when you have a full deflection. So here when the needle is showing you 120 parts in this case. So only in this case you have the guaranteed accuracy of maximum 0.5%. For all other values that are below this maximum deflection the relative error gets bigger. I will show you a calculation example. So uh, this is how the accuracy class is defined. So you see here, this is the maximum absolute error for the full deflection. And this is the range. Typically, the minimum number, the minimum reading is zero. So then you have this, just the maximum reading. And uh, the accuracy class is also a relative error. So it's expressed in percent. Typically, it is rounded to some numerical series, so to some number in this numerical series, like 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 1, 2, 5, and so on. So, uh, in our labs, you will typically see instruments with 0 0.5 if you would need some more accurate experiment than 0 0.1 is more accurate. Uh, if you have instruments that are only for information, then you may find 2, 5 percent. But that's not accurate enough for a lab. So now, how to, to make use of it? Let's say I have a, a voltmeter uh, which has accuracy class 1, so 1 percent maximum relative error with a full deflection. Uh, the range is 300 volts and I measure voltage just 60 volts. So if I use this image, let's say this would be 300 volts, but I am somewhere around here, I measure just smaller voltage. Uh, so if you calculate the absolute error, you have measured 60 volts, absolute error 3 volts. Okay. Uh, relative error right now with 3 volts compared to 60 is 5%. So you see that uh, because I have measured a smaller voltage, the relative error has increased. The reason why this is, is that I did not use the analog instrument correctly. The correct way how to measure with an analog instrument is to always use a maximum deflection of the needle. So you should 
try to rearrange your experiment in such a way that you are close to this point, to this deflection, because here at this point you have the minimal relative error. If you measure somewhere around here, you have a very large relative error, and it's not a recommended way how to use an analog instrument. So the correct way how to measure with an analog voltmeter or any analog instrument is always to try to maximize the deflection. Of course, it's not always possible, uh, so then you need to consider that you will have a large relative error. There are experiments, and we will do it also on the lab, uh, where you cannot do this simply because if you change the range of the voltmeter, it is changing the internal resistance. If you look on the analog instrument, then you will find more information on the scale than just the accuracy class. For example, here, this is the analog voltmeter that we will typically use in the lab. So I will let you look on it. Um, that's, that's the one here. Uh, so we have already discussed this 0 0.5, so 0 0.5 accuracy class. Uh, this horizontal line means that uh, this is a DC voltmeter. So you have to use it only for DC voltage. It will not work for AC. Then uh, this star and number two, this uh, means that it was tested with a test voltage of 2000 volts and it should sustain this voltage without destruction. Uh, this describes you the system. This is called magnetoelectric. It describes you what is inside. So inside of this instrument, uh, there is a, a coil. The coil is connected to those terminals. And uh, this coil is uh, in a thin air gap with a magnetic field. And when you connect the voltage to those terminals, then there is a current flowing through this coil and the force is created because this coil is in a magnetic field. So this helps you to understand what you can measure with this instrument. It means that you cannot measure an AC voltage because this system is not working for AC voltages, it's working only for DC voltages. Then here, this symbol, this inverse U, is describing you in what position should the instrument be during the experiment. So this symbol means that it should be in a horizontal position on the table. So, for example, if this uh, would be the voltmeter, then it has to be like this on the table, and then it's sure that it will have those parameters. If you tilt it like this in a vertical position, then it will not have the defined parameters, and you will not be able to read with an accuracy class of 0 0.5. And the Number on the left, 600 volts equals 1%, is saying you that if you use this instrument on a range of 600 volts, then uh, here you don't have 0 0.5 accuracy class, but you have 1% accuracy class. So we'll use those instruments uh, quite uh, often on the lab, so that's uh, why it's important to, to read from them, from them correctly. Uh, we will also use quite often digital instruments. Uh, can you can you pass the, the voltmeter to the other people as well? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we will quite often use uh, digital instruments as well. And for digital instruments, it's uh, quite different. For digital instruments, it typically depends on the manufacturer. What is he saying in the manual? Some manufacturers state the accuracy in this form. They say it's some percent of reading plus some number of digits. Some other manufacturers say it's some percent of range plus some number of digits. And some manufacturers, they combine this. They say the accuracy is some percent of reading plus some percent of range plus the 
number of digits. Number of digits uh, means what is the minimal resolution of uh, the instrument. How is the digital instrument working? Let's say it's a voltmeter and I want to measure the voltage between 0 and 5 volts. So a digital instrument is non-continuous so it will divide this into a fixed number of parts let's say like this and uh, even if uh, the voltage is here or here or here you will still get the same reading which corresponds to this part and this is basically the digit so the size of the digit will determine the precision with which you can measure the input signal. And uh, typically, uh, in a manual of a digital instrument, it's given like this. So this is the range, and this is the resolution, which is then the digit. Uh, this is an example of uh, a digital voltmeter, so something like this, which we really use quite often. And uh, you can see here, that we have range 600 millivolts and in this range I can have resolution of 0 0.1 millivolt if I use the range of uh, 600 volts then I have resolution at 100 millivolts so the resolution is changing with the range and uh, typically the higher the range the higher the size of the digit so uh, the larger this part the relative accuracy remains the same because the number of parts the number of bits uh, in the range is constant but uh, this gets bigger and bigger and for this particular voltmeter you see that the accuracy is stated as 0.5 percent of reading plus a digits so if I want to calculate the absolute and relative error, I can use this formula and I can calculate what I want. As I said, some other manufacturers, they will give you something else. They will say it's 0.5% of range plus 0.2% of reading plus three digits, for example. So for this digital instruments, you always need to look in the manual and uh, you need to read how uh, the manufacturer is defining it. How to use it? Uh, we can take those numbers and we can calculate the absolute and relative error. So this is just an example uh, of uh, a digital voltmeter, range 60 volts, resolution 10 millivolts, and measured voltage 55.3, some random numbers. And in the manual for this selected range, I have found that it's defined like this. So at the end, I can make an estimate about the accuracy of my experiment. I can say I have measured a voltage of 55.3 volts, and here I have the absolute error, uh, which is 0 0.49 volts. Some questions? Okay, good. So we'll train this a little bit more uh, on today's lab class. So this is one way how we can estimate the accuracy. All this is based on the assumption that we know what is the correct value. I already said that we never know this. So the second option is uh, to use statistics and uh, to repeat the experiments more often and to calculate statistics and these statistics will uh, help us to make an estimate how accurate is the experiment. This is called uncertainties of measurement and it's much more complicated than the previous way. You typically need to repeat the experiment many times and you need to calculate the average standard deviation or you need to have detailed knowledge about the experiment, about the instruments, about the sensors, about their accuracies. And then you can judge the uncertainty. So all this simply because we never know what is the correct value which we will use for comparison. 
we will discuss two ways how we can calculate uncertainties. One way will be called type A uncertainties and this is based on statistics and the other way will be called type B and this is based on knowledge. If you repeat your experiment you have to use or you can use type A evaluation and this means you repeat the experiment 100 times and then at the end you calculate something. Uh, type B is based on knowledge so you need to uh, know about the experiment, you need to have calibration certificates, you need to know uh, how did you connect the instruments. So it's not statistics, but statistics is typically hidden behind it. So someone have provided you the uncertainties for your voltmeters, for your power supplies, for uh, your instruments, and you receive this as numbers. So someone had to do the statistics, but it's not you who will do the calculations. So we will train both methods how to do it. And we will combine the knowledge at the end to a one number, which uh, will be called combined uncertainty. Uh, we will do the lab class today. So I will explain uh, now how we do the experiments and how we evaluate that and you will train it uh, in the next hour. So we will start with type A evaluation. Uh, let's imagine uh, I will have the following experiment. Here I have a uh, battery and uh, the experiment is that I will measure the voltage of the battery. So let me simply reconnect the voltmeter and we'll look on the voltage. The measurement is repeated over and over and for each experiment we see that we have a different value. The reason is that we have noise, we pick electromagnetic interference, the temperature is changing a little bit. So for every experiment we have a little bit different value. And the point in type A evaluation is that we repeat the experiment over and over, we record the values and then we make an estimate what is the best value that represents my voltage and how wide is the interval. In other words, uh, if I would look on this voltage, for example, like this, I can say, okay, the best estimate will most likely be somewhere between. So let's say it will be the average of the voltage and then the accuracy of the experiment will be described by some width of the interval and I will say if this is quite narrow then it's accurate if it's large it's not that accurate as it could be. So this is the uh, point in type A evaluation. I say we repeat the experiment. So here you have an example of the numbers that I have obtained from the battery. So this is the experiment number and this is the voltage. And I can repeat the experiment over and over. What is important is that I need to repeat the experiment under the same conditions. Here it's quite easy. I just repeat the measurement over and over. But uh, if you have like a unique experiment, you the experiment may be really expensive, it may take a real long time because you just obtain one number but you need to start your machine, you need to have many people around it and so on. So it may not be as easy as it was here in this example. Uh, the best estimate is typically the arithmetic mean, so the average, 
say typically because it, not always but in our experiments it will be the arithmetic mean which you calculate by this formula and it is the best estimate that we can have we say okay I had those numbers on the input and uh, the best estimate of the correct value is the average and the width of the interval is uh, also calculated from the measured values and uh, we will calculate it as uh, the standard deviation of the mean so it means how wide is this interval when I calculate this from those numbers now the question is is this good enough or not well it depends on the number of experiments it's clear that if I re repeat the experiment 10 times I'm less sure that my result is correct if I compare it with 100 experiments or 1000 experiments so we, this is fine if uh, your number of experiments is large enough and what does it mean large enough so uh, we need to add into the equation also some relation between the number of experiments and between the width of the interval in other words if I have this width of the interval from thousand experiments I'm more sure that this is okay then if I repeated the experiment two times and I still have the same weight I'm less sure because I had made lower number of experiment so the question is what is the sufficient number of experiments there is a whole description how uh, and why uh, this can be calculated uh, I will show you only uh, one way how this can be done and this is based on a document that is called Guide to the Expression of Uncertainty. It's a standard document and uh, it is uh, based on a statistical distribution uh, that is called a student T distribution. Uh, this is quite interesting because initially it was uh, made uh, by some researcher like 100, 150 years ago who uh, was interested into making beer and uh, he wanted to calculate what are the properties of uh, my samples on the in the average if I have only a limited number of samples so if I have like five or ten experiments how can I estimate what will be the total uh, total total batch uh, and how good it will be so he developed something that's called a student t distribution students because he, it was not his name, but he published this under the name student. So this document, the guide to expression of uncertainty, is based on this student distribution, uh, and it is calculating something that's called degrees of freedom. And very simply put, degrees of freedom is the number of experiments minus one so if I have made 10 experiments then this will be 10 minus 1 which is 9 and I will look in a table where I will search for 9 degrees of freedom uh, we will use this table in the lab but uh, this is just a selection uh, here I have the nine degrees of freedom and here in those columns you have different numbers for different probabilities what does it mean here we have 68 percent 90 95 and so on it means that what I calculate from my numbers is the width of the interval but if I want to be more sure that this is the best estimate I need to increase the weight of the interval and this number that you find in the table is nothing else than the let's say magnification how large will the final interval be so it means that if I have repeated the experiment a million times then I have a very large degree of freedom here 
So let's say infinite. And if I want to be sure within 68% roughly, I can take directly my result. But if I want to be better, I want to be sure within 99%, I need to multiply the width of this interval by 3. That's the 3 that you see here. So in my case, when I have repeated the experiment 10 times, the degree of freedom is 9, and now I can choose what fraction I will have in this table, and typically we choose something like 99 or 95 percent. So we take whatever we have obtained from the standard deviation, so this is the uncertainty type A, we multiply it by this number, this number is called the coverage factor, and we have the corrected type A uncertainty for the specific probability that we have chosen. So if you want to use 68%, you can multiply it by 1.06. If you choose the confidence level 99, you multiply this by 3.25. And you see, as I'm increasing the number of experiments, then this coverage factor gets smaller and smaller because I'm more confident that my results are correct. Of course, also here, with increasing number of experiments, the cost will increase as well, and here you need to repeat it an infinite number of times. Uh, so at the end, from this evaluation, we will have our estimate of the correct value, which is the mean value, and this will be the uncertainty. So let's say I have measured a voltage uh, 50 millivolts and with uncertainty of 5 millivolts. So this is one way how I can write the result. And don't forget that I need to also add what confidence level did I, cho did I choose. So uh, the result will be 50 millivolts, uncertainty 5 millivolts, and this is for the coverage factor uh, of, uh, for 99%, for example. So that's one way how you can write the result. Another way, so basically this is this number and the width of the interval. Another way how you can write it is that you write, this is my best estimate, and plus this, and minus this. It's also possible. So uh, you use exactly the same procedure, but at the end you write that it's the mean value plus minus uncertainty. And if you use this way, you need to take the number from the table and divide it by 2. Because you want to keep the total weight of the interval, and you just give plus this and minus this. Of course, this assumes that you have the same positive and negative uncertainty. It's not always the case, uh, but very often it is. So here, uh, this is possible only if you uh, assume that the interval is symmetric. Uh, in this case, the values in the table here are divided by 2. So uh, we will work with both ways in the labs. Uh, we will typically work with this way. So in the lab manual, uh, you will find the table with values directly divided by 2. And the same thing here. Uh, don't forget to state what confidence level did you use. So uh, for example, that we have used here the 99% confidence level. We'll train this in the lab class. Uh, now, type B evaluation. Type B evaluation means that uh, we have some knowledge about the experiment. We know what instruments do we use. Uh, we know what uncertainties they have. We know how the experiment is connected. 
uh, we have some prior knowledge about the accuracy of our sensors and so on. So although we say that type B evaluation is not based on statistics, the statistics is hidden. We need to have some input numbers. The manufacturer had to make some calibration. He will provide us with calibration certificates and we will have some uncertainties in the certificates. We uh, know how the experiment is connected so that we can add the uncertainties correctly together and so on. So for us, it's not statistics. We will just use simple formulas, but uh, we have the statistics hidden somewhere. Uh, type B evaluation can be done also if you have only one experiment. So uh, if you have a unique experiment, you can use type B evaluation to estimate its accuracy. Of course, you cannot do this uh, for type A evaluation because here you see the minimal number of experiments for type A is two. So I can re estimate also with one experiment uh, with type B. Now how to get type B uncertainty? Uh, the easiest way, and unfortunately not a very likely way, is uh, to get it directly from the manufacturer. So you buy a voltmeter and uh, in the voltmeter manual you will find out, okay, the uncertainty is this and coverage factor is this. Uh, typically this is not the case. Uh, uncertainty is typically not given and you will be very lucky if uh, you will find it directly. Uh, at least you have to pay some extra for, 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 for the manufacturer uh, because typically manufacturers they do not give you uncertainty, they give you accuracy. This is the reason why we have discussed accuracy, relative and absolute, because it allows you to, under some conditions, to calculate the uncertainty. But if you're really lucky and you get the uncertainty from the manufacturer and the coverage factor, you can calculate what is the type B uncertainty. Now, what if you are not lucky? Uh, if you're not lucky, you need to make some assumptions and you may calculate type B uncertainty as well but if your assumptions are not correct then your calculation will be wrong. So how to calculate it from accuracy? Let's say I have a digital voltmeter and in the manual I have found that uh, the accuracy is let's say 0 0.1 volt and I want to calculate what is the uncertainty. So at this point I need to understand what is going on in the instrument. What probability distribution do I need to choose if I want to calculate accuracy? We'll start first with uh, analog voltmeter. Let's say I have a scale like this. Here I have some parts and the needle is somewhere he over here. So in an analog voltmeter, I'm reading from the scale and if it's correctly calibrated, then I'm sure that the voltage is somewhere between this number and between this number. Now if I read correctly from the scale, then the probability that it's over there will look something like this. So this is a probability distribution function. I'm almost sure that it will be somewhere around here, but I'm less sure that it will be here or here. So for analog instruments you should choose this type of probability distribution which is called a normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. And the type of the distribution that you choose is described by this coverage factor. So this number k will be different for different distribution function. So for analog instruments you should 
choose the Gaussian distribution. For digital instruments, it works in a completely different way. For digital instruments, it looks like this. I have some range, I have some parts, those are the smallest parts that I can read, and if my voltage is within this part, I cannot distinguish if it's this voltage or this voltage or this voltage. If the instrument is correctly calibrated, I'm just sure that it's somewhere around here. And I do not know if it's here or here or here or somewhere else. So, for a digital instrument, the most likely probability distribution function will say that the probability is zero outside of this interval, so like this, and here the probability is equal for all points. So this is a rectangle, it is a rectangular distribution function, and of course here the area of uh, this rectangle needs to be one. So for digital instruments you should choose the rectangular distribution function. And the coverage factor will be different for the rectangular distribution and for the Gaussian distribution. So here for this case it is a digital voltmeter and therefore the square root of 3 is uh, the coverage factor for this rectangular distribution. The resolution is divided by 2 because I want uh, the result to be expressed uh, as a voltage plus minus. So this assumes that uh, I have a, this symmetrical interval. And the square root of 3 is uh, the coverage factor. We will not go into uh, how this is calculated, uh, but this is just uh, a selection of different coverage factors for different distributions. So here you have the rectangular distribution, square root of 3. Note that this is for pr probability only 57.7%. So if you want a higher degree of confidence, then you need to choose a different coverage factor. So this is only for 58% roughly, for digital instruments typically. For analog instruments, we choose this type, the Gaussian distribution, and uh, for a probability of 95% roughly, the coverage factor is 2. So I would take this number divided by 2 and I have the uncertainty. Uh, if you have a different shape, different distribution function, uh, you will have different coverage factors. This, all this is for a given confidence level. So if, for example, here you want to calculate it within 99%, you would have a different number here. Uh, in the labs, uh, we will use the rectangular distribution and the Gaussian distribution. So we have type B evaluation, we have type A, and now we can combine the knowledge about the experiment and uh, the number, the repeated uh, the results from the repeated experiments. So we can combine type A and type B uncertainty and we can calculate the combined uncertainty, type C. So typically we use this formula, type A uncertainty, this is the corrected one and this is the type B uncertainty. So type A is the numbers from the experiment and this is our knowledge from the experiment. If we combine it together, then it covers only 68% of the result and uh, we assume a normal distribution here. From statistics, from mathematics, uh, you probably know that 
if we combine more pr probabilities together, it tends to go closer to the Gaussian distribution. So even if uh, our initial distributions were, for example, rectangular, if we multiply them or sum them together with other distribution functions, then the result gets very close to, distrib to Gaussian distribution. So for type C uncertainty, we assume that this is a Gaussian distribution and it covers roughly 68% of the confidence level. So if we want to extend our confidence in the result, then we need to multiply that by the coverage factor and the coverage factor for Gaussian distribution for 95% is 2. So here I take my result, I multiply it by 2 and I have the final result, the best estimate, that's the average still, plus minus extended standard uncertainty, that's this number, and I have to add under what conditions did I calculate the result. So I typically write the coverage factor equals 2 for some given probability. We'll train this in a few minutes in a lab where you will have a manual and we'll have an experiment and you will calculate the uncertainties. Some questions? No questions? Okay, so that's all and we'll meet at 2.15 in lab 409.